Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm excited to talk to Peter Brandt. He's one of the best, shares so much with, uh, with many investors and traders getting started in the markets. We'll get his take on the current market environment. Plenty of uncertainty. I did a webcast earlier today on sentiment indicators. We talked about elevated volatility. Now, the VIX is coming off a bit recently, but stocks certainly feel as choppy as ever with the S&P pushing higher over 1%. NASDAQ about double that, 2% higher with consumer discretionary and communication services one and two. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts, using data visualization techniques, the best practices of the technical toolkit to better quantify investor behavior and better understand what is happening around us as investors. I think the big debate a lot of investors, traders have been having in the, la having in the last couple of weeks is whether we are seeing a bear market rally that is continuing to push higher, or at what point do you relabel a bear market rally into the beginning of a big recovery, right? I, uh, I actually did a survey earlier today, and we're doing one on social media right now, asking about your next uh, the next 10% move in stocks. Do you see the next 10% move higher, which would take us to new all-time highs, or the next 10% lower, which would take us to a new low for 2022 on our social media uh, accounts and also on stockchartstv.com on the TV page. You can answer that poll question. I would encourage you to do that. We'll share the results in a little bit of, a, of an earlier poll we had this week uh, in terms of an overall uh, market outlook. We have great guests on the show. I'm excited to talk to Peter Brandt here, uh, welcoming him back to the show. He always does a, a fantastic job for us. Other guests that we have through the remainder of this week, tomorrow on Wednesday the 23rd, Willie Delwich. Willie is a uh, strategist at All Star Charts. On Thursday, we have Roman Bogomazov. Ron is an expert in Wyckoff analysis, which is a framework for understanding the markets uh, using Wyckoffian analysis. Next week, we have David Auerbach, expert in real estate and REITs on the 29th. Uh, this week later on uh, the 24th, on Thursday, we'll uh, produce our next uh, episode of Chart Madness. We did this last year, had a lot of fun taking a bracket of 16 stocks and doing a bracketology style debate of, uh, of strength and weaknesses of 16 different charts. We'll have the crew back together this Thursday, the 24th, 11 a.m. Eastern. You can find more information and print out your own bracket today at stockcharts.com slash chart madness. Let's continue on this show with our market recap. We'll talk about this bear market rally phase and what signals we would need to see to maybe turn, turn that perspective into more of a bullish uh, take. But first, let's talk about a poll that we asked recently. Uh, we asked you late, recently on our social media accounts, how often do you look at monthly charts every day? Not every day, but a couple times a week, maybe a couple times a month, or never. I'm concerned about the 11% of you that said never, because I would tell you, even if you were a short-term trader, understand the long-term, understand the big picture, the environment in which you're trading in the short-term. Because remember, a lot of the movements that you see in price are actually longer-term investors uh, you know, making changes in their portfolio. So understanding the big picture is, is incredibly important. Most of you, and it was close, said maybe a couple times a month. I don't have a problem with that. Those of you that said you look at monthly charts, I, a thumbs up from me. Um, I, I uh, actually do a monthly chart review for my premium members at Market Misbehavior, and we go through some monthly charts. It can be really helpful because it takes all the noise, the day-to-day, -day, the flickering ticks, gets rid of that, and really focuses on really materially how has the market evolved from one month to the next. You can see very clearly a rotation that started in November continued to push lower uh, through the last uh, couple months. So thank you so much for answering that poll question again. We have a poll question running now about what 10% move you see next. I'd encourage you to do that. We'll refer to that at the uh, end of this week on Friday's show. Continuing our market recap, we have the S&P up over 1% today, closing above 45.11. Uh, you know, 4,400 was a key level that we've talked about. I feel like every one of these Levels has seemed important, but we're sort of in that middle ground between uh, 4,400. We've now gotten above the 200-day moving average for the first time uh, in, uh, in a couple months here. And now the question is, what's, uh, what's next? We'll look at a chart of the S&P here in a few moments, but 
Let's catch, on some, catch up on some of the other asset classes. The NASDAQ, the NASDAQ 100, both up about 2%. The VIX continues to come down, uh, currently just below 23 other asset classes, interest rates continue to push higher. And we've talked about that prospect of higher rates for many moons now. I feel like it's really starting to materialize with the 10-year yield actually approaching 240, uh, which again is sort of the highest levels we've seen uh, in a couple of years now. You're really seeing that rising rate environment, but the yield curve is actually flattening and the spread between the twos and tens is actually going down. We're very close or getting closer to an inverted yield curve. And if you Google inverted yield curve, you will hear the dreaded R word, recession, because that's often a relationship that has happened over the last you know, 10 plus years. You have a yield curve going uh, inverted, uh, and then often a recessionary period uh, follows soon after. So you know, could this time be different? That's a lot of the discussion I'm seeing are basically people talking about how this time is different. That concerns me a little bit because that's a dangerous phrase to be throwing around as an, uh, throwing around as an investor. The dollar index, by the way, is flat from where it was yesterday using the UUP, uh, the dollar bullish ETF. Commodities coming off a bit, a uh, mix to be honest with you, but gold and silver both down uh, a little bit. And oil prices off a little bit as well with energy, the worst performing of the 11 S&P sectors. Looking at cryptocurrencies very briefly, you have Ethereum right around a very key level, which is 3000. I found with cryptocurrencies, with Ether, with Bitcoin, big round numbers tend to be meaningful. It's interesting to me that uh, Ether earlier uh, today got above 3,000, now sort of chopping around right at that level. My question is, is there enough upside momentum, enough buying power to push Ethereum above that 3,000 level to stay? That would be an open question I would, uh, I would be curious about. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500 here, refreshing it for the closing data. I mean, th this has been an incredibly strong little stretch here. Now, this was last Friday when we got above the 50-day moving average. I would say mentally sort of dial that one off in terms of importance only because it was a quad witching day on Friday. It's usually a lot of volume, a lot of movement. It's not necessarily a big directional signal. However, all the days surrounding there have essentially, after the Fed meeting, it's been bulls over bears. It's been, it's been rally mode uh, for stocks. Now, a number of things have been fairly encouraging, I would say. You know, RSI, if you look at a measure of momentum, has broken above trendline resistance. The price behavior itself has broken above a trend line, taking the January peak and the February peak. Those are not negative developments. Those are all encouraging. I think S&P 4,400 was a key level. That was the swing high from early March. We actually got above there. So now you have the S&P making the very least a new swing high, which is encouraging. So at this point, I would say by most measures, you're sort of in a neutral mode. I think if you're bearish, you could write this last week off as a short covering rally, as a growth led mean reversion move before the next big move lower. If you're bullish, you feel very validated that the S&P has once again regained its 200-day moving average. So now that you've seen that development, I think the question is what next? Things I'm looking at are the 200-day moving average. We have now closed above it today. Can we hold that, right? Tomorrow, very often what happened when the S&P got down to 4,200, you would trade below it and even close below it, but then the very next day would rally back to the other side. And it showed you that even though we were selling off, there was accumulation happening, right? There are people buying the weakness there. So the opposite, you see people selling strength now that the S&P has regained its 200 day. That's a question we would answer uh, tomorrow and through the remainder of this week. The other question for me, do we get above 4,600? That's a Fibonacci resistance level. That's the resistance from early February. If we would give it above 4,600. I don't know how you could describe this market as bearish at that point. I probably won't either. I'll start talking a lot more constructive about the potential of regaining 4,800, if not much further to the upside. But first things first, can we break above resistance and hold it? That's sort of the open question I would have in mind. Some other charts to look at here very, uh, very quickly. We talked about a chart of the S&P. This is another one that we refer to pretty regularly, which is looking at breadth conditions. These are advanced decline lines on four of the major averages, uh, the uh, New York Stock Exchange, common stock only, AD line, and then large caps, mid caps, and small caps. Now, all four of these have bounced off of a fairly beaten down level. All four of them had made a new swing low earlier this month in March. All four of them now regaining their 50-day moving average and coming back there. So I would have to describe them as best as a neutral right now. You know, I would argue that uh, when you think about price and breadth and sentiment, a lot of times you'll get bombed out sentiment readings, which a lot of times are sort of a leading indicator, a contrarian indicator, right? Sentiment is so bearish that it all of a sudden becomes bullish. Breadth indicators are often second because an improvement in breadth tells you a lot of individual names are starting to work, and it tells you you can start to be encouraged about the overall market environment. Price is often the last of those three to recognize 
that a trend has shifted. So I think you're seeing bombed out sentiment. Uh, I, I think we've recognized uh, that in terms of really bearish readings on the AAII survey, the name exposure index all being fairly, uh, fairly bearishly positioned uh, in, uh, in recent days and weeks. But breadth conditions really haven't improved a ton. They've bounced off of lows, but the question is, have they really materially improved? I would argue the AD line for the New, York, uh, the New York Stock Exchange is still in a downtrend of lower lows and lower highs. That pattern changes, and I would feel less negative about the overall uh, longer-term trend uh, in, the, uh, in the market. Another one to look at, uh, maybe two more on breadth if we can. This is looking at the percent of stocks above their 200-day, which is literally right at 50%. That line is a horizontal line in bright pink because that's a great reminder for me to think about where is the weight of the evidence in terms of individual stocks. When this is above 50%, that means over half of the S&P are above their 200-day, just like the S&P regained its 200-day today, or a bunch of the individual members of the S&P uh, index regaining the 200-day uh, as well. It's not quite happening. It's right at 50%. It's dead neutral. It's dead even. Getting above 50% and staying there would be a much more of a bullish uh, development. Finally, if we look at the bullish percent index on the S&P, it's actually very close to getting above 70. Now, that can be encouraging. And if you look over the last couple of years, extended bull market phases have seen over 70% in the bullish percent index. And again, that looks at individual stocks and how many of them are in a buy signal from the, uh, from the point and figure charts. Almost over 70%, which tends to be a bullish signal if it remains above uh, 70%. The last couple of times it's hit 70%, though, it's pulled back very quickly. Those have been short-term market tops, so it could be an important chart to watch here. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back with my guest, Peter Brandt. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We so appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the market activity using the toolkit of technical analysis. We have one of the best joining us in a few moments, Peter Brandt. Before we get there, a couple quick announcements. First off, we're going to do a mailbag segment a little later in today's show. These are all questions that have come from viewers like you. You can get your questions to us three different ways via email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com, via Twitter at FinalBarSCTV, via YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours live on the air in our next mailbag segment on Friday's show of this week. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That's our on-demand platform. Uh, so much great content, expert guests like Peter Brandt and many others, special events like Chart Madness, The Pitch, our year-in-review and market outlook specials, all for free at StockCharts.com or on your mobile device. Just search for StockChartsTV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Peter Brandt. Peter is a uh, trader, educator, longtime market practitioner. He's the founder of Factor Trading Company. Peter, welcome to the show. Welcome back. Good to see you. Hey, it's always good to be with you, David. Just listening to you, I'm always amazed at how quickly you cover the waterfront. You, <laughs> present, you present an analysis of the market in 10 minutes that would probably take me two hours. I appreciate My wife tells me I talk way too quickly, so I appreciate it. I'm going to share your positive <laughs> feedback with her so there, honey. Um, but thank you, Peter, for joining us today. We're going to start with your chart of the dollar index. Talk us through what you're seeing here. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You talked about the survey you did of people on daily charts, weekly charts, monthly mm -hmm. charts. And heck, I even work out to quarterly charts. I mean, I, I believe in these long term charts. I, I just that they're not necessarily great for signaling and timing of individual trades. But they are so useful and absolutely useful in trying to gain a perspective of a market. You know, we always hear trade with the trend. Well, how do we define trend? And to me, they're defined by some long term underlying trends in the market. The US dollar index is a perfect example. You know, we hear uh, so many people are bullish or bearish in the market, but we look at the monthly chart of the U.S. dollar, what we see is is a market that has been stuck between 88 and 103 now uh, for a period of about seven years. We're, mm -hmm. we're in a huge, huge trading range. And keep in mind, the dollar index is heavily focused on the euro currency. 
Uh, and, and so there's a lot of correlation between dollar up, yeah, euro down. And so we, we were heavily weighted toward the euro in the U.S. dollar index. But, yeah. you know, people wonder why in the world would the U.S. dollar go up is what I believe is going to happen is we're going to test the upper side of this massive multi-year trading range in the dollar index up toward 104. And people wonder, well, why uh, with the Fed printing all of these dollars would the U.S. dollar index go up? And mm. the reason is, is the U.S. dollar index does not reflect the purchasing value of the dollar, which would be uh, really affected by the printing of money. What it does is relative to other currencies and you know, other, you know, so we have the whole argument of fiat. What's the better? What's the worst fiat currency? Mm. And I just see the dollar index going up. And, you know, depending on what happens in Europe, you know, we could have a fleeing of, of the euro. Uh, and so, you know, you can build a case that the US, that the dollar index could really take out the upper end of this trading range, depending on uh, uh, the flight out of the euro relative to Russia, and we could see the market bu bust through that upper band of the trading range and have a run to, you know, 110 to 115, you know, 115 areas. So, you know, it could get really interesting, but at least I think we'll, we'll take a peek at 103.80 here on this run up in the dollar. Uh, we didn't script this, Peter, but thank you so much for featuring some monthly charts. We didn't, we couldn't have lined that up better with our poll question than you showing some of the wisdom of looking at some long-term charts. And our second chart is looking at uh, Bitcoin. Talk us through this one. Yeah, I mean, you know, the whole Bitcoin community is really interesting. I mean, you, you kind of have a presence on Twitter. And you, you know, you see kind of short-term thinking that that I'm not used to. Uh, I mean, people panicking, the market's down a few percent and people are talking about going to the sewer and goes up, they're talking about going to the moon. But, you know, Bitcoin's in a big trading range. It's in a very historical bull market, an incredible bull market. I've traded 47 years and never seen a bull market like Bitcoin. But, you know, we deserve to be in a trading range here because after all, from the March 2000, uh, 20 low into the April 2021 high, we saw the market go up 17x. Yeah. And so we're just taking a breather. And I think we'll continue to take a breather, you know, with, you know, 68 on the top side and 28 and change on the bottom side. And I, I, I believe at some point we're going to resolve this trading range and have another big run in Bitcoin. Uh, but we certainly for right now are just kind of stuck in the mud. And so what happens for from day to day is relatively meaningless here. You know, we could go on back down and really explore the lower end of this trading range at 28, maybe even take a peek below it and get some panic selling. Mm. But, uh, and so I think this is where we're at. We, we've been here for a year. We're in a big trading range for a year. Bitcoin has not gone up for a year. Uh, and, uh, but I do think the long-term trend is up. The trend is your friend. And, the you know, Bitcoin monthly chart really does gain a perspective on Bitcoin that you lose if you try to follow price of Bitcoin on a day to day basis. Yeah, it's, and it's such a great reminder here that showing that range on the monthly chart, you see how much there, you know, you could pull back a decent amount to write 28.8 and still be within that, that framework of a decent, uh, a decent sort of uh, consolidation zone. Your last chart, by the way, Peter, is silver. Now, gold and silver has gotten a lot of attention because really starting to work after a while of not working. What's your take on precious metals here? Well, I, I like precious metals, and I'm just wondering what it's going to take to really get them to move. I, I mean, we mm. saw pretty much a, a new all-time high in gold. Silver's lagging it. I have liked silver. Uh, I've liked silver all the way back to 2020 when it had the, a huge run up from $12 and change on up. Uh, into the high 20s, I've really been kind of anxious for silver to have another big leg up, which I think it will have. And, you know, again, you take a look at the, the monthly chart and, you know, we're in a trading range that started in July, August of 2020. We're chopping within that range. We have a very, uh, we're forming as a classical chart, it's something I look for as patterns. We're forming a wonderful a rectangle pattern. I sure. think at some point in time, this rectangle is going to be resolved to the upside. And, 
you know, we can have a big run up into the high 30s and possibly even go take a peek at where we were in 2011 and also way back in uh, 1981, you know, and take a look at $50 silver again. I think that's eventually coming. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure when, uh, but, but certainly in an inflationary time, when we measure the value of commodities against fiat currencies, silver is extremely cheap. It's, it's an industrial metal in addition to a, a precious metal. And, and so I think it's just a matter of time and patience that we'll see a big move in silver, David. Peter, this was a masterclass, a masterclass in the value of long-term charting. It's a pleasure to see you. really appreciate you uh, sharing some thoughts with us. Stay safe. Be well. We'll talk to you again soon. You too. Thanks a lot, David. Thanks for having me on. That's Peter Brandt. Peter is a founder of Factor Trading Company, a trader and educator. And when I think of social media, I think there are a lot of negative connotations to social media, a lot of things that I think it's made life more difficult. One of the bright shining spots on something like Twitter is people like Peter who know a lot and share a lot. So I'd encourage you to give him a follow at Peter L. Brandt on, uh, on Twitter. Let's continue on today's show with our uh, final bar mailbag. As a reminder, we get all, your, all of our questions from you, sharing us, uh, sharing us your questions in the, last, uh, in the last couple of days. Let's get to question number one. Do scans work on Dow Jones industry groups? I've created scans for CCI crossing specific boundaries like negative 100 and positive 100. I love that question. And the short answer, unfortunately, is no. The good news is we are in the process in 2022 at redesigning our scanning engine. And feedback like this is super, super valuable to us because it's going to help us figure out what the scanning engine uh, could do. If you are trying to make sense of the scanning engine, by the way, um, you know, if you create a new scan, you can get to it right from your member dashboard. It's using a simple um, uh, terminology, uh, you know, a, a simple programming language to create the scans, but it's all driven by the drop down. So what you can do, and I guess what I would say, instead of running the scan on individual industry groups, what you can do is run the scan and try to identify what uh, industries are represented in the scan. And that's what I do often. So at the bottom, you can actually filter based on, um, we, we break it down by the 11 S&P sectors, and then our uh, you know, uh, uh, way that we uh, allocate the different Dow Jones industry groups into the 11 S&P sectors, you can filter on particular groups. Or what I tend to do, to be honest with you, is get look at the results, and I'm kind of fudging the results here very quickly, but looking at the results and then grouping the results, sorting them by industry and or by sector, you can bring in market cap and other things, uh, scooter rankings and, as well. But that can be a really helpful way to see which industry groups are represented in the scans. That's what I would do for now. I appreciate your feedback, and I'll make sure that our developers know that that's something we, uh, we want to we wanna break down and, and see if we can get into the new and upgraded scanning engine coming your way later in 2022. Next question, Dave, please look at the attached chart. It's a very simple case of an imminent death cross for the SOX index, the SOXX, which is one of the uh, semiconductor ETFs, actually. I have not found any commentary on this on stock charts or elsewhere. Um, I, do, I, do, I forgot to put your chart in here, but it was pretty much like this. This is the uh, SOX ETF. The two common ones are SOXX and then um, SMH is the one I usually use, but they're, they're pretty similar. When we're looking at the iShares Semiconductor Index, you're referring to this, which is called the death cross, right? So a golden cross is when the 50 crosses up through the 200-day most commonly. That's what we would talk about. Uh, and if the 50 crosses down through the 200-day, you call that a death cross. I will tell you this, so the reason why I don't talk about it a ton is because we did a lot of testing on moving average crossovers. You know what didn't work particularly well in terms of actually adding value to the investment process? Death crosses and golden crosses. They have fantastic names, and I know on financial media we love to highlight them because it's such a thing. In, to be honest with you, though, if I was trying to design a trend-following system using moving averages, I would always use exponential moving averages because they're just way better at that. That's why my market timing model is all built on exponential averages. So I would encourage you to think more about that if you're trying to understand trend changes in uh, the semiconductor ETF. Having said that, yeah, the S&P, the SOX, a lot, uh, you're you know, looking at potential death crosses. I know a lot of people would talk about that. I've not found it to be a particular meaningful uh, signal in terms of actually timing those markets, and uh, and that's why I haven't referred to it. You see the fact that the market's up literally as we're uh, as we're doing the uh, the death cross here. Next question: With all the talk about interest rates these past weeks, how would you construct a chart that would show the flattening and steepening of the yield curve? I love that question so much, and I love that because I have found my work with institutional investors, which was a bulk of my career, was spent at Fidelity and at Bloomberg working with uh, investment. 
uh, institutional investors. There was a, a great focus on the fixed income markets because conventional wisdom is the bond markets tend to lead the stock markets. Arguably right now where you see the bond and, and stock markets actually giving you different signals. Stock markets telling you everything's fine. Bond markets actually not quite telling you that. And in general, I would tend to lean more into the bond markets as being a better measure of overall, uh, you know, overall uh, market structure. Having said that, you can look at the shape of the yield curve by using some of the indexes that we, uh, that we have. So dollar sign UST10Y is the ticker for the 10-year yield uh, point. So that's on the, uh, on the current treasury curve, the 10-year uh, maturity. Dollar sign UST2Y is the two-year point. So you literally can use the syntax ticker one minus ticker two, and you put that in the symbol, and it'll show you the spread between the two. Um, it's a really great, great way of looking at two different interest rates and how they relate to one another. Credit spreads, if we had, uh, you know, if you had some, some sort of index where you could track yields on a corporate bond, you could do that, uh, a similar sort of syntax as well. So this is showing you as the line is going down, basically the spread between the 10-year point and the two-year point is getting smaller, and that means the yield curve is flattening. And that is not a good sign if you think about market history and an inverted yield curve, which means this gets below zero, doesn't tend to end well for the markets. That tends to uh, come right before recessionary periods. If you look back over the last 20-some years, you find that's actually a pretty consistent pattern. I've seen a lot of commentary now basically describing why that just won't be the case this time. I don't know if I buy that because I'd much rather follow market history and what this is, uh, what this is uh, telling you. I would also tell you just one final point. If you go to charts and tools, one of the coolest features we have is the dynamic yield curve. This is a beautiful visualization. The yield curve is on the left. You can actually take your mouse and rewind and actually show how the yield curve is changing over time. So we were looking at a spread between the two-year point and the 10-year point. You can actually look at the entire curve. And here you can see how the uh, shorter end of the curve is coming up. That's what's making it uh, almost an inverted, uh, inverted shape. Thanks so much, guys, for those great questions. Keep them coming. We will keep answering them. But we need to wrap today's show. Go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the AAII survey. I did a webcast earlier today for market misbehavior where we talked about five key charts for sentiment, uh, for market sentiment. This is one of the charts we spent a good amount of time on. I just want to show you a deeper history of the AAII survey. Most weeks on Thursday's show, we dig into the sentiment indicators like the VIX and other survey data. But this is an interesting one that we spent some time with. And what I wanted to illustrate was currently there are about 50% of the respondents as of last uh, Thursday's reading uh, we're bearish. The last time we've been that low, uh, besides a couple observations in 2022, was back in early to mid-2020. Two things I want to il illustrate on this. Look at how long it took the market to go higher before that bearishness was alleviated, right? The, the uh, survey still had about 50% bears uh, pretty regularly for about six months, really until the September, October, November breakout was finally when you exited that sort of disbelief phase. And that's sort of the anecdotal smart money, usually the beginning of a new bull market phase. Most people don't believe that that's the case. The big third leg, which arguably we're either in the middle of or have finished, is where the bulk of participants are starting to participate. The end of the move is when the anecdotal smart money starts to sell and individual investors, retail investors are tending to continue to push the uh, the price higher. So it's worth noting really how long the uh, the market can stay or the, the uh, survey data can stay that negative because of the disbelief. I would also note this indicator can, can become a lot more negative in extended bear market cycles. So look back to 2008, 2009. Talked about a couple breadth charts. I just want to highlight those very quickly. Still just about 50% of S&P members above the 200 day as we go through the remainder of this week and hasn't updated for today's close just yet. Can that get above 50% and stay there? That would be a bullish development in that chart. Finally, the bullish percent index is right at 70%. The last couple times we've hit 70% in November of last year, in January of this year, both of those times were tradable tops. Those were peaks in the market before we came back down. So we're coming down for we're coming out of a fairly uh, negative pattern here where this indicator was below 50% for a number of weeks here. We're now right back to 70. Is this the end of the bear market rally lining up with some of those previous short-term market tops? I think this could be one chart to help you uh, gauge that. Can it get above 70 and stay there? Folks, that's our show for today. Special thank you to Peter Brandt joining us from Factor Trading. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night.
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.